All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and start uh, start up from here. I hope that, is it started at 5.15 or 5.10? 5.10. All right, then I feel okay with starting. Um, for some of you guys, uh, there were some issues with the Thursday assignment. You went through and, and copied and pasted from the PDF and put it directly into your notes. Um, that's not the way that I wanted you to do it. I want you to go through and listen to the notes and make notes that are uh, meaningful for you so that I can tell that you watch them. If you just went through and highlighted and copied and pasted everything, uh, then I can't tell whether or not you watched them. And so um, I did put in there, you know, don't copy and paste this, and I didn't give you credit for it, but I will figure out some way to uh, make that up to you in case it was a rookie mistake and you didn't know that that's what I um, would not have wanted. So um, I'll have a way to get credit for that um, if you missed it. Uh, there's a couple other people that put it uh, into the Dropbox in other forms other than Word or PDF. Um, I can't open anything in the Dropbox unless it's in Word or PDF. So if it's Pages or RTF or HTML, or any of those other files, uh, I can't even open them on my computer. Um, so you're going to need to, I'll get you in just a second. You'll need to, uh, you'll need to get that uh, submitted to me um, so that it works. Uh, another part of this assignment is that uh, I want you to be able to uh, get things into the Dropbox without having uh, some kind of crisis situation or uh, that you can't get it in. Um, you have to get it in. So if you emailed me something or, uh, or weren't able to get it uploaded, um, give yourself enough time if you are having problems with your home computer, um, do it from a computer here on campus. Um, if you are, are worried about doing an assignment, you have to be able to get it in through Dropbox so that I can open it in Dropbox and grade it in Dropbox. Um, I can't just grade things that are sent to my email. So that's part of the assignment. You have to get it done. Uh, if you haven't been able to get it done, um, it's definitely not going to count as much as your, your test grades are going to count. Um, that's going to be the biggest grade item for this course. Uh, but if you are starting to miss three or four or five of the homeworks, um, I would start uh, figuring out what it is that you're doing wrong and, and getting that fixed. Somebody had a question here in the middle? Yes, sir. Uh, I didn't understand what your question was. Uh huh. Uh, if, if you continue it on after that set of instructions and then save it as your own thing and, and yeah, that's fine. Oh, okay. Yeah. As long as I can tell that you watch the videos and you took notes like in your own voice that's, that shows that you understood what was happening and yeah, that's, that's absolutely fine. Um, anyone else? Okay, if you have specific individual questions, definitely see me afterwards um, or come talk to me after one of your labs or when I'm in the office um, and we'll make sure that we get that, uh, get that worked out. Um, so you should be getting an idea of what's going on from this point forward and how to get your assignments submitted. It's not just uh, how to follow directions, but it's also um, the directions are becoming more and more specific, and so uh, you're learning good skills in order to do well in the rest of your courses. So um, I think that that's, a, that's an important thing. Um, so what we had talked about the last time was Chapter 4, um, talking a little bit about how do cells get their energy, uh, where do they find it, how do they uh, break apart um, the different molecules in order to release the energy from those molecules, uh, and about how the source of all energy is from the sun. Uh, now we get into uh, how is all of that information transmitted from one generation to the next generation? Um, what is this code of life or this uh, code of heredity? And guys, please don't be mumbling while I'm trying to talk. It not only bothers me because I can hear you back there wondering if you have questions, but it also bothers the people that are around you. So if you have a question, please ask me directly. Otherwise, uh, 
please don't be rude to the people that are around you. Um, so we are continuing on with chapter 5. Um, let's see if I can get my... Uh, and chapter 5 is going to be talking a little bit about uh, DNA and gene expression. Um, you are not just a collection of DNA, of these long strands of DNA, um, like you saw in your laboratory where you uh, took the DNA from the chicken liver and took the DNA from the strawberries. Um, DNA is not just one big long strand uh, that your body reads in order to have this information. Um, your DNA is going to be segmented into genes, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, and we'll also be talking about the biotechnology that is involved in uh, manipulating those genes or uh, fixing the bad parts of the genes in order to uh, make healthy cells. Um, how do we find out what's in our genes and then what do we do with it from there? So, uh, of course, it doesn't want to work on me. Um, DNA is something interesting because uh, we didn't always know that we had DNA um, as this kind of recipe for life. Um, at a certain point, we were able to uh, discover what DNA was, and then from the discovery of DNA in the 1950s, um, then we eventually got to being able to examine it, uh, DNA in large quantities and understand how DNA provided a kind of fingerprint uh, in order to uh, explain who you are or uh, identify you as you. Um, one of the biggest discoveries, I believe, of the 20th century is that um, we were able to exonerate or uh, release certain prisoners uh, from jail because we found that the DNA from their cases uh, didn't match the DNA of the, um, of the suspects. So um, at one point, uh, we were able to actually say, like we, many of you probably remember back to the O.J. Simpson case, or if you're uh, younger than that, you, then you may have grown up on uh, CSI and Law and & Order where they're checking DNA and finding out who did it. Um, and this is really kind of uh, one of the interesting things about uh, DNA as a science is that um, at a certain point there were people uh, in jail who said, I didn't do this and they had been convicted of crimes, uh, DNA was, uh, was gathered from their crime scenes, but uh, the, the scientific community didn't know what to do with it at that point. Um, when they finally figured out DNA technology and they were able to go back and look at these uh, cases where uh, these suspects were proclaiming their innocence um, and they were able to look at the DNA figure, fingerprints, um, they were able to actually find out that over 200 people that were on death row um, actually had not committed the crimes that they had been charged with. And so uh, 200 people were actually released from prison uh, because it was shown that they could not have been at this crime scene uh, for this crime that they were charged with. And one of the big things about, um, that was interesting about this is that all of these suspects had been convicted based on eyewitness testimony. So eyewitness testimony had said, uh, yes, I identify that person, I know that they're the one who raped me or killed this person or I saw them commit this crime, um, and it was found that they were actually not guilty of the crimes that they were being charged with. So something like eyewitness testimony is actually very... Uh, found to be a very inconsistent form of evidence, but DNA, the DNA hasn't proved to be wrong uh, at this point. So DNA is something that is a uh, scientific investigation that we can go about finding um, whether or not these people were there at the time that these crimes were committed. And we've been able to release certain people from prison. Um, so the most common reason that DNA analysis overturns uh, incorrect uh, criminal convictions is because of eyewitness testimony. And so um, I have some really good, uh, really good videos about um, one of these gentlemen was convicted of a horrible crime and it turned out that they were able to uh, gather um, 
gather DNA fingerprints from other people and find out that he could not have possibly committed this crime. Uh, so maybe I'll show that uh, video to one of you, to you guys at some point. It's actually very, very interesting. Um, so what they have called this is the age of the gene. There's lots of questions out there about um, what are genes capable of making us do? Are they uh, going to be responsible for some of our actions? Like, is uh, dependency a genetic disorder? Is your addiction to cigarettes or drugs or alcohol going to be found in your genetics? And so if we cure that genetic disorder, if we make it so people do not have addictive personalities, will it make it so that people don't uh, drink or smoke or do drugs anymore? And then you also have to think about the flip side of it, is the drug or alcohol or tobacco industry going to allow that to be, uh, to be found out because it would destroy the, the dependency of people upon those things. So there's kind of some competing, uh, competing stories that are out there. Um, also, if you found out that, uh, that your child um, who had your genes was going to have some kind of addictive type of disorder, um, or we may find out that some some point um, there's nurture or there's nature, and some things are going to be found to be ge genetic, and other things are going to be found uh, to be a cause of the nature that's all around of us, uh, all around us. And so, is your DNA your destiny? Does it uh, put you on a certain path? And then think of some of those, uh, those movies where they said, um, should we just go ahead and lock people up that have these genetic disorders knowing that they have addictive personalities or knowing that they have uh, genes that are going to make them very violent or make them very angry? Um, they have done some uh, testing on prisoner populations to find out if they all have a gene in common um, that would then predict violence or predict uh, criminal, criminal behavior. So this is really a, a, an interesting and growing uh, part of biology, is finding out um, what part of you is your genetics and what part of you is uh, created by this environment around you. So is it your destiny? Um, the DNA molecule is going to contain instructions for the development of all living organisms. And one of the things that I think is so interesting about everything that's alive out there is that everything, all, everything is made up of these A's and G's and T's and C's. Uh, you are made of the same A's and T's and G's and C's, but in a different order than every other living thing out there from the smallest single-celled bacteria to the biggest tree to a mushroom uh, to a horse to, to anything. You have A's and G's and T's and C's and so does everything else that's alive, everything that's out there. And so uh, between the 1900s and the 1950s, uh, we came up with uh, two important discoveries about DNA. Uh, the first of them being that DNA contains all of the instructions uh, in order to create every single part of your body and control how it grows and develops. So you have a copy of DNA inside of every single cell of your body, and that recipe for making you uh, is found in every single cell of your body. So the recipe to make your heart is found in all of your skin cells, it's found in all of your heart cells, in all of your brain cells. Every cell has a copy uh, or a recipe for creating you, and that's common to every single cell out there. It's just, in some cases, when we're making one type of cell, the uh, genes are expressed, and in other types of cells, the genes are not expressed. So the instructions to uh, build a heart are expressed, um, or the instructions to build your liver are not expressed, um, but that copy of DNA is there in every single cell. Uh, then the instructions encoded in the DNA molecule is passed on from parents to offspring. So if your parents don't have that recipe um, or they uh, don't have those genes, then there's no way that those genes could then be passed along to their offspring. So all of the DNA, this DNA recipe, uh, came from your parents, and it's interesting because uh, part of it came from your mother, part of it came from your father, uh, and it was kind of this random toss-up of what was going to then be passed along to you. 
That's why a lot of us look like our brothers and sisters or look like our cousins uh, or look like our parents, but then um, we have those little subtle differences that are sometimes recessive or sometimes dominant in our parents or in our brothers and sisters. Uh, that's also the reason why when your uh, mother went into labor with you and went to the hospital, um, that she uh, had a baby human and not a baby something else. We always know that humans are going to lead the way to other baby humans. It's not like your mother's going to go into labor and have a litter of bunnies. Uh, you know that those, that DNA expresses a human and not expresses anything else. Uh, and then we look a little bit at how those DNA uh, A's and G's and T's and C's are going to mutate and that's what causes uh, changes in future generations. Uh, most of the time, not good changes, but um, you could have good changes nonetheless. So uh, these are the uh, famous scientists that came up, with, um, came up with DNA. And they weren't the first to see DNA because there was no electron microscope that was strong enough at that point in the 1950s to be able to actually see what the A's and T's and G's and C's look like. So uh, Watson and Crick were actually physicists. They were able to um, look at theoretically where these molecules would have been located and come up with the positions mathematically. And so what they did is they uh, would have come up with this drawing of the uh, DNA d double helix structure, this uh, twisting ladder that DNA looks like. Um, then they would have built a model of it and um, just to prove how right on they were by their mathematical calculations, um, then in the future we, with our scanning electron microscopes, we were able to see that they were actually right. Um, so interesting that a lot of things in science come up because of predictions or, um, or theories or sometimes just uh, flat out guesses that are then uh, mathematically figured out and uh, based on the laws of physics actually um, proved to be true. And so uh, the structure that they came up with in the first place uh, was that DNA is a double helix. And by double helix, it means basically that we have this ladder shape with the sides of the ladder and the rungs of the ladder going across. And uh, the helix shape means that it's twisted around. So it's this double twisting ladder. And that's the, uh, the uh, name that, that DNA is known for, that it is this uh, double helix. And so uh, you can see that there along the sides of the ladder, uh, you've got your nucleotides, which are the basic building blocks of DNA. Um, and you've got this phosphate group, which is making up the sides of the ladder. Um, you have the, um, the ribose or the deoxyribose, which is the sugar that's part of the outside rung of the ladder. Um, and then these um, nitrogen-containing bases, which are your A's and your T's and your G's and your C's, um, that then hook up together by these, uh, by these bondings. Um, and they're always going to bond together in, um, in a similar pattern. So wherever you have an A, which is an adenine, you're always going to have that bonded up to a T, uh, which is a thymine. Wherever you have a G, which is a guanine, it's always going to be bonded up to C, which is cytosine. So A's and T's, G's and C's, the A's and T's always go together, the G's and C's always go together. And the way that I always remember that is um, A, T, G, C, Austin, Texas is a great city. So that's, that's my, uh, how I remember it. And um, so by double helix, what we mean by that is that um, we have all these rungs of the ladder that are bonded together. Um, and as they bond together, the sides of the ladder are then going to, to twist around. Um, and these are called the nucleic acids um, and the, the nucleotides. And these are uh, the building blocks of the recipe that makes up you. Um, so twisted ladder and then uh, the nucleic acids and the nucleotides. Uh, so one of the things that we often do when we're talking about what is this pattern or what is this message that we find in DNA, um, we will find that uh, sometimes we have um, the A's and the T's and the G's and the C's, uh, depending on whether it is DNA, 
Um, we also have another, uh, another form of, uh, of nucleotide, which would be uh, RNA, uh, which is ribonucleic acid, and we'll talk about that a little bit further coming up here. Uh, but when we talk about DNA and talk about this pattern making, uh, what we often look at is if we have one side of the uh, strand of DNA, how do we then end up uh, hooking that information together uh, in order to make copies of our DNA in order to pass it along to the, uh, to the next cell? So if I have one side of my DNA and the code is ATTGCTAGCGC, then we can always predict what it is that's going to uh, bond together to make up the other side of the DNA. Since A always goes with T and G always goes with C, we can always figure out what the other side of the DNA molecule is since we have um, A hooking up to T, T to A, T to A, uh, G to C, and so on and so on. So uh, once we know one side of DNA, if we're trying to figure out the other side of the DNA, um, that's pretty easy to figure out. Uh, then if we're going to be talking about RNA, which is the, uh, the uh, structure of the molecule that's going to be able to move around within the cell, um, we call that messenger RNA that travels uh, through the nucleus out into the cytoplasm within the cell. Uh, the mRNA, um, if we have an A, now it's going to be hooked up to a U. So A is going to hook up to, or adenine is going to hook up to uracil. So whenever we have DNA, A hooks up to T. Whenever we have RNA, A is going to hook up to U. And so if we were to look at the other side of uh, DNA, if we were converting it into RNA, um, it would be A, U, U, G, U, uh, G, C, U, A, G, uh, C, G, C. And so uh, one of the things you're going to have to ask yourself a question about, are we converting to DNA or are we converting to RNA? And um, I, I can't proclaim that you guys are going to perfectly understand it by, by looking up here. Uh, it is something that you'll have to look at in your book, and you're going to be talking a little bit about it um, in the lab this week and the lab that's coming up next week. So if you feel a little confused, you'll actually have some working knowledge of it coming up here. Um, so if I were to then ask the question, which answer uh, of DNA uh, will base pair with the following sequence? Um, if we have uh, AG, TTC, TCA, TGT, what would the other side of a DNA molecule be? So just look at that and, and think about it for a second, or not think about it for a second. So yes, you are correct. It would be, uh, it would be three. And the reason for that is that A always hooks up with T, uh, G always hooks up with C, and so on and so on. And so um, you could practice those all day long if you were really excited about it. Um, and so then getting to moving from DNA into this uh, bigger collection of uh, sequence of DNA, um, our larger section is called a gene. So genes are sections of DNA that contain certain instructions in order to make proteins because um, we can't just have our recipe for making our uh, making our human or making whatever life form, we actually have to be able to make proteins from that recipe. Just like if you were making a chocolate chip cookie from a cookie recipe, uh, you have to be able to make the proteins from this recipe in order to be the building blocks of you. Uh, so then the reason that DNA is considered to be the universal code of life uh, for everything on Earth is that we haven't found anything on Earth that is alive uh, without having DNA inside of it. Um, kind of goes back to your universal cell theory, which says that all living things are made up of cells. Well, just like all living things are made up of cells, uh, all cells need to be produced through this recipe for life that is DNA. And so since we haven't found anything yet, doesn't mean we won't find it in the future, but as of right now, the one thing that scientists know is that um, DNA is this universal code of life. Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, it stands for uracil. It's uh, U-R-A-C-I-L. 
Um, uracil is in uh, RNA. In DNA, we have A, T, G, and C. In RNA, we have A, U, G, and C. And so we'll talk about that coming up here in just a minute. Um, I'll give you a, a little further example of that. So anybody else have a question while I am stopped there? Okay. So um, inside of every single living organism, uh, we have these instructions uh, for building virtually every organism on Earth. So. Um, every onion has onion DNA, every human has human DNA. Um, we're not going to have uh, any other organism uh, just popping up from one organism. Uh, but we do have this code that is passed on from parent to offspring and then from offspring to their offspring. And I'm sure if you've ever uh, looked at your family tree that there's no point in time where you look back and there was anything other than humans. And if there was, there might be some kind of issue right there. Uh, but humans lead to other humans, lead to other humans, lead to other humans. And yes, we see some um, little mutations in that DNA, but nothing extraordinary, nothing, nothing wild. Um, so if we're going to look at these patterns and look at how we go from uh, a genome, which is a... Um, kind of a recipe for every gene that's out there. So some of you may have heard of the Human Genome Project. Uh, and the Human Genome Project is a copy uh, and a recipe of every single gene that goes into making up a human. Um, so in a genome, we have an organism's complete set of DNA. Um, what that means is in eukaryotes, which are our higher ordered, multicellular types of organisms, um, that we can find this information within the nucleus of every living cell. So inside of every fungus cell, inside of every plant cell, inside of every animal cell, uh, we're going to have this complete instruction for making um, another one of those individuals. And so you can see here in this cell, we've got a eukaryotic cell. The way that we know it's eukaryotic is because uh, we have this uh, nucleus inside of a prokaryote, which would be a bacteria. You wouldn't have a nucleus, you would just have a circular string of, of DNA. Um, so what happens with DNA is that the DNA is wound up uh, very tightly into these large bunches, uh, which would be your chromosomes. So uh, chromosomes have unique pieces of DNA um, which in prokaryotes are going to be in this circular. So like I said, with bacteria, we've got this one circular uh, chromosome that goes around, is kind of bunched up together in the center of the cell. Uh, but in a eukaryote, we've got these chromosomes which are wound up really tightly to look like these little X's that are inside of the nucleus. And uh, for those of you that just had your biology course in, uh, in high school, you probably remember looking at those little X's and counting the number of X's and matching them up because one comes from your father and one comes from your mother. And we'll be looking a little bit at those uh, patterns of inheritance that will be coming up. And so um, we've got these tightly wound uh, pieces of DNA um, that are going to... Uh, that are going to be sometimes hundreds of millions of pairs long. Um, and humans, this is something important to write down, uh, have 23 unique chromosomes. So we have uh, 23 pairs of chromosomes. 46 chromosomes total, but 23 pairs, 23 uh, coming from your mother, 23 coming from your father. If you have more than 23 or less than 23, um, that's usually a, a mutation, um, which in many cases is going to be fatal to the offspring. Um, so you've got two copies of each one of the chromosomes, one coming from the mother, uh, one coming from the father, for this total of 46 chromosomes. Um, and inside of each one of those chromosomes, um, we've got these genes, which are this specific sequence of DNA. Uh, and the DNA, uh, it says that the average is about 300 base pairs long. So, or I'm sorry, 3,000. So 3,000 sets of A's and T's and G's and C's is going to make up the information to uh, code for certain characteristics. 
like um, coding for eye color is made up from multiple genes, coding for hair color, uh, coding for skin color, and not just the things that make us unique, but also the things that make us human, like that each one of us has two eyes, and we have one nose, we have two arms, and we have two legs. Um, the things that are, are going to make us uniquely human are going to be coded for um, in those genes, um, which are then going to help to produce proteins, which then go about building up our bodies. So um, one of the things that we find that makes us different from every other living thing out there um, is that the number of chromosomes is going to vary from species to species. Obviously, um, uh, a lot of plants are going to have the same numbers of chromosomes. Uh, some of the, uh, the larger animals are going to have a similar number of chromosomes. Um, we have a similar number of chromosomes to the primates, um, which are like apes and gorillas and uh, the, other, um, the other primates that are out there. Uh, but if you look at corn and you were look at the, gene, uh, the genes that express making corn, uh, corn has 10 unique chromosomes, so it's uh, going to have a fewer number of chromosomes than we would have. If you look at fruit flies, fruit flies only have four chromosomes, and that's one of the reasons that uh, humans or uh, scientists really like to go out and study fruit flies, because uh, since they only have four chromosomes, they're very easy to manipulate, it's very easy to tell uh, what characteristics are linked to what chromosomes. Um, and a lot of the very basic um, experiments in uh, introductory, introductory biology is going to be using fruit flies. Um, dogs and chickens, both of them have 39 different chromosomes. So that means 39 coming from their mother, 39 coming from their father. So a total of, what's 39 and 39? 72. Um, so they have 72 total chromosomes, but 39 different chromosomes, Se 78, sorry, 78. Um, and uh, goldfish have 47. So if you think about a human compared to a goldfish, it seems like we should have so many more chromosomes uh, than a goldfish would have. Uh, but what we have really come to understand is that the number of chromosomes don't necessarily make uh, the more complicated the species. Uh, we just have the number of chromosomes being passed on uh, from parents to offspring, um, and you're inheriting those, one from each one of your, your parents. So um, in looking then at, at genes and looking at alleles, um, you look at that more specifically in the lab that you're doing this week where you're uh, looking at the different alleles that make up your dragon. And for those of you that haven't, haven't done it yet, um, it's extremely exciting. Some students love it. Some students hate it. I know that, that some students think that it's horrible, but some students, some students really like it. They get to show their creativity. Um, so within these species, um, we have alternate versions of uh, these given proteins. So an allele is just going to be a code that says one thing or the other thing is going to happen. Um, so as you can see in this one, they're looking at the, um, the codes for flower color. So in this allele number one, uh, we're coding for protein number one, um, and protein number one is going to influence some uh, form of the, the gene and is going to make flowers have um, some color to them. Uh, then in allele number two, found in a different place within the gene, uh, it's going to code for another protein. So it can make the flower uh, have different patterns, have different colors, and um, you can have multiple alleles, lots of different alleles, coding for a lot of different things. That's why when it comes to flowers, we don't just have two colors. If we go out there and look at flowers, it's not like flowers are all white or purple. We've got so much variation that happens in flowers, and we also can have environmental characteristics um, that are changing flowers. Like uh, if you look at the hydrangeas, if you plant hydrangeas in an acidic soil, uh, they're going to be like a pinkish color. If you plant them in a, um, in a very basic soil, you start to have that purplish or bluish color. If there's something in between, you can have some variation. Um, so that's something that 
Um, we don't know whether uh, it's all according to the genes or it can also be according to the environment. So very complex and something for us as scientists to learn more about. Um, so one of the things that we find is, you know, we tend to think as inter introductory biology students that all genes should code for something. You tend to think, well, if there's all those A's and T's and G's and C's together in this pattern, then they should actually do something. And what we as scientists have come to find is that not all DNA actually contains instructions for making those proteins. Um, so what we find is that we have one gene that codes for eye colors in humans, and then we'll have sequence, 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 many uh, thousands of base pairs long that doesn't seem to do anything at all. And then we'll have another gene sequence that codes for something. So like in, um, in humans, it says here um, we have 3,400 uh, 3, uh, uh, genome as our genome size. That's the number of genes that go into making the specific characteristics that make us us. And then if you look all the way to the bottom, we have an amoeba that has something like 6,700 or uh, 600. 70,000 uh, different uh, genes going into making that amoeba an amoeba. And you think about the size of an amoeba, so very, very tiny, and the size of a human, so very, very big, and it would seem like the more complex the organism, uh, the more genes it should have telling the body what to do. Um, but what we found is that that, that is not the case. So um, it says here, an onion has more than five times as much DNA in every cell uh, than a human does, and a newt and an amoeba have even more than that. So fruit flies, very, very basic, but we're not even close to being as basic as a fruit fly, um, but we don't seem to have all that many more genes than it has. And definitely a newt and an amoeba seem to be uh, extremely complex. So we as scientists then ask, well, why does this happen? Let's see, how are we doing for time? 547. Okay. Um, so an onion has five times as much DNA as a human does. Um, so why doesn't that make uh, them more complex than us? Why isn't an onion so much more complex than a human? Um, and the reason for that is the proportion of the DNA that actually codes for genes. So in humans, 2% um, of our DNA is going to actually code into making us us. And that other 98% of the DNA is what we call junk DNA. And for as far as we have gotten in understanding the genetics of organisms, we still as scientists do not understand um, exactly what that junk DNA does. And so at some point as we're... Um, searching and doing experiments and looking at the evolutionary history of organisms, um, we'll eventually figure out what that's for. And I think that that will um, that'll change a lot about science as we start to learn uh, what those portions of DNA that don't have any code in it, that just seem to be these random collections, uh, when we find out what they actually do, that's going to be, um, that's going to be amazing for us. So. In an E. coli, just a single-celled bacteria, 90% uh, of its DNA is going to code for something, but in a human, only 2% of the DNA codes for something. So that's got to be significant. We just don't know why that happens at this point. So um, like I said, it's all about coding versus non-coding. Inside of a eukaryotic cell, they're inside of the nucleus. Um, we've got all of our chromosomes all wound together. We've got those regions of DNA that are going to code for that protein. So the little sections that make up each one of the genes and then all of that junk DNA that's found in between. Um, we're going to figure out why uh, it doesn't code for any protein and what exactly it does. There are some theories out there as to what this junk DNA does, maybe uh, switching on genes at a certain time or... Uh, switching off genes when it shouldn't be coding for any protein. But we'll figure this out at some point, and uh, whoever figures that out is going to be a very, very rich person. 
Uh, so getting into how do genes work, if you look at an overview of how genes work, uh, just as we have this recipe for a chocolate chip cookies that tells us what ingredients to put together in what ratio um, and then what to do with them in order to uh, build a chocolate chip cookie, um, we've got every cell of a human uh, having that code, making those proteins, putting them together in that specific ratio in order to uh, build the proteins that make up uh, AU and they are inside of, of every single cell that's inside of your body. Um, so this means that if you were to take a skin cell, just one single skin cell, you would have the entire code for building an entire you inside of the nucleus of that one single skin cell. So then we have to ask ourselves, well, uh, why doesn't it grow another me? Why does it, why does it stop? Why do our uh, proteins make uh, certain organs and not make uh, other organs? Why do they make skin cells and not blood cells or heart cells or liver cells? Uh, that's the big question about why do certain things turn on and certain things um, are, are left, in the, left in the background. Um, and this is because uh, our genes have uh, what's called a genotype and a phenotype, which you'll um, also look at further in lab this week. So what a genotype tells us is basically um, what is this code inside of uh, each and every organism? What are all of these genes uh, found inside of every single organism? And then if we look at the phenotype of an organism, um, we look at the physical structure of an organism. So a uh, uh, genotype is the genes, the phenotype is the physical structure. So um, if you're looking at uh, the gene for tallness in a pea plant, um, if the uh, allele big T makes a plant tall and little t makes a plant short, um, if we look at a pea plant and it's got the genotype big T, little t, that's the code for the genes. If we look at a plant and we say, oh, that's a tall plant, the phenotype is that it's tall. Or if we say um, that is a short plant, then uh, the phenotype is that it's short. So whenever you see a genotype, you're going to see a collection of letters together. Whenever you see phenotype, you're going to see this collection of physical characteristics or physical traits. Um, so. Uh, in looking at how genes work, what you have here in the purple up here is inside of the nucleus of every single one of your cells. Um, you've got your uh, long strands of DNA, like I said, sometimes can be 3,000 uh, pairs long. Um, we've got our DNA and then the little segments that are coding for some characteristic uh, would be considered your genes. And so those genes are then uh, copied along uh, by your RNA and uh, carried through the nuclear pores because the uh, code has to go from inside of the nucleus where it doesn't really do anything and then is copied and carried outside of the nucleus uh, to the ribosomes, which are these protein producing structures. And the ribosomes are going to read this little message or read this mRNA uh, and then are going to go about uh, putting all of these proteins together. And all that a protein basically is is a collection of amino acids. So the amino acids are these um, little, uh, you see the multicolored little round spherical, uh, these are the amino acids there. Uh, the, mRNA is going to have this code for putting them all together. It's going to be basically combining and mixing them all together. Um, and then when we get a long chain of amino acids together, um, that's when we call it a protein. And the protein is going to be uh, the building blocks of you. It can also be enzymes to make the processes happen inside of you. Um, it can be the hormones that make your body act the way that it does. Um, so we're going from uh, inside of the nucleus being carried outside of the nucleus, um, going from DNA to uh, messenger RNA, eventually to um, this uh, 
protein making ribosome and then the ribosome puts all the amino acids together and makes a protein. So the two different processes that we have here um, is we have what's called transcription and translation. In transcription, um, we have the sequence being copied uh, from the DNA to this uh, molecule of mRNA that is capable of going from inside of the nucleus and going through the nuclear pores and traveling out um, into the cytoplasm of the cell, uh, going to the ribosomes and getting ready to be packaged all together. Um, and we have translation, which is the process of uh, sequencing the gene, of figuring out um, what the different por uh, portions and proportions of amino acids are, um, putting them all together and making them into a protein. And so this is a very uh, complex process, much more complex than this, uh, but this is just the basic process of how we go from DNA eventually getting to proteins, because that's what's got to happen in order to build a U or build a any type of living thing. Um, so the ingredients that we have to have in order to build up these proteins that have to be present inside of the cytoplasm, so floating around inside of the jelly of this cell, we have to have free amino acids um, and we have to have uh, ribosomal units, which are these uh, packaging structures putting together the free amino acids. Uh, then we also have to have what's called transfer RNA, um, which is going to uh, transfer the amino acids and uh, end up translating them into these proteins. So um, here we have a picture of what the transfer RNA looks like. So at the bottom, we've got our code uh, from our DNA. Um, we uh, transcribed it into mRNA. So we went through this process of going from the DNA inside of the nucleus um, to the mRNA, which travels outside. Um, and we have these um, attachment sites that are helping to pull all of these amino acids from out in the cytoplasm and put them together like an assembly line. Just like you can probably think of a, a car manufacturing plant um, where you think of this assembly line where we have the shell of the car and then we have the big machinery that's coming in and placing each part of the car onto the car uh, and putting it all together. Um, that's exactly what we're seeing happen inside of the cytoplasm of all of these cells. So we've got our transfer RNA that's taking all of these um, little pieces of amino acids that are floating around out there in the cytoplasm um, and using them and sticking them all together in order to build this protein, which is the, the building block of U. So as you can see in this picture, we have um, AUC, which we know that we have RNA because we see those U's. Um, so we have AUC, UCA, and all of those are in little blocks of three. We call that a triplet, or we also call that a codon. So a codon is a um, set of three bases um, that then the transfer RNA is going to come along and um, read those three bases and put the right amino acid in the right place. So thinking that this is happening along a strand that might be 3,000 bases long, this is an amazing process that everything manages to go in the place that it needs to go without a whole bunch of mistakes. Because if you were doing this at a microscopic level inside of every single one of your cells, building up all of these proton, uh, proteins, you would have so many opportunities for mistakes to occur, it's amazing that we actually don't have um, all of these mistakes. And when we do have mistakes, that's when we eventually get to uh, mutations. And so uh, this is the process looking at it going from very big to very small. Um, we have our piece of DNA that we start off with there near the, the letter one. Um, we, so we have our piece of DNA which is going to uh, begin to unwind. It's actually got enzymes that are going to pull it apart. Um, and so uh, the RNA is then going to recognize and bind. And I think you do have a picture of this in your book 
Um, so it's probably something that you want to look back at. Um, and there's also some really good um, YouTube videos about how this happens. So I'll try and find uh, some of those for you so that you can, you can actually picture it. Sometimes just hearing somebody talk about it and, and looking at pictures of it happen um, isn't as good as seeing these 3D animations of how everything comes together. So first step, our DNA is pulling apart. Um, then we have our mRNA, which is coming along and, um, and reading these bases and putting together uh, a chain of mRNA. Um, you can see the RNA polymerase, that's the name of the enzyme, uh, that's then pulling everything apart, unwinding, um, and eventually rewinding everything back together. Uh, then we have um, uh, transcribing happen. Uh, where the DNA strand is processed through this little chunk, this uh, green chunk of RNA um, is putting these base pairs together. Um, and then um, it's sending off this, uh, this piece of mRNA so that it can then go pick up the parts of the, um, of the amino acids that it needs in order to build up our protein and build up um, our building blocks of a living thing. And then our DNA doesn't just unwind and go its separate way. Um, it actually unwinds, sends some of that information out to build the, the proteins, and then it's going to rewind back up and uh, wind itself back up into chromosomes um, and, then, uh, and then be back in its, uh, its uh, most occurring state. And so uh, transcription is a pretty detailed process. And uh, you can see basically the, the four steps of the process that happen here. So we have uh, the unwinding, the recognizing of those base pairs. We have the transcribing where we're getting the right thing in the right place. Um, we have the termination of the mRNA. So um, it detaches. And then we have everything kind of winding back up together. Like I said, I'll, I'll try and show you a, a YouTube video of how that actually happens. So um, what we eventually get then is our genetic code, which is a list of all of the genes um, that make up uh, who we are. And so uh, these codons are going to be these little lists of three characters that are then going to um, go about making up these um, these chemicals that are going to be uh, the building blocks of you. Just like if you've ever heard of um, like bodybuilders going out and, and taking supplements that are made up of, um, of these different amino acids, like um, I think it's, uh, which one? The glycerine, I think, is one of them. Uh, glutamine, you sometimes hear about tryptophan. If you've ever uh, gotten really tired after eating a big turkey dinner, uh, tryptophan is something that's found in turkey that makes you very tired. It's also found in red wine, so that can also make you tired. Um, a lot of these are going to be the interesting building blocks of the foods that our, then, our body then goes to use those proteins um, in or, order to build up us. And um, I'm going to skip over this one because I don't want to blow your mind with that at this, uh, at this point in time. So let's then go on to talk about uh, what happens when your uh, genetic codes mess up. Um, what happens when we have these changes to our genetic code um, and then what's going to be, um, be affected by these, these general things. So uh, some of the causes and effects of mutations is that if we have this alteration of our uh, bases within our DNA, it can lead to certain structural changes, um, which then our body is going to produce the wrong proteins, um, which then is going to be harmful to you. Um, or it can be passed along in the sperm and egg. Um, if it's passed along at, um, at the sex chromosome level, um, it can actually make it so that uh, the sperm and the egg never work in the first place and never go on to uh, produce the living organism. So we can either have uh, changes in the proteins at the uh, organism basis or we can have a range of effects that happen um, at the embryo, uh, embryonic basis. So 
Um, here we can see a fruit fly. Like I said, we as scientists really like to study fruit flies. So we look at a normal fruit fly, has its antenna, it has its eyes in the right place, doing the right thing. It's got all of its mouth parts found in the right place. Just a second. Um, and then in a mutant fruit fly, when the, the genetic code is wrong, instead of producing the uh, antenna where the antenna should be, um, it then goes on to uh, produce a uh, extra eye that actually doesn't help the organism to see. The organism then doesn't have its antenna, so without antenna it's not able to uh, sense what's going on in, in its environment. Um, and that would be a, an example of a bad mutation, a mutation where it's missing a body part and instead um, has the wrong body parts in place of that. Yes? Uh, for the last one, uh, oops, sorry, wrong, wrong direction. Hold on just a second. This one? Okay. Okay, so let's, let's look back at our, our picture of our mutant fruit fly. Um, just like you probably don't think fruit flies are, are beautiful creatures anyways. It looks even worse when it's got a set of four eyeballs. Um, here's another picture of a different mutation in fruit flies. Um, it's very easy to alter the genes of fruit flies, so it's easy for scientists to, to study mutations in fruit flies. Um, this is another fruit fly, uh, normal on the left-hand side, and then um, in the mutant, it doesn't have its eyeball in the right place. It's got this uh, mutated gene that makes the eyeball uh, not grow the proper way. So even in just changing one gene, we change the entire eyeball um, of this fruit fly. So um, if the gene didn't change, uh, didn't change extremely, and the fruit fly had an eye that was then better for it to be able to survive, um, then maybe that mutation um, would help the organism to be able to survive and pass along uh, this mutation to its offspring. Um, but most of the time, uh, mutations are not going to be a, a helpful thing. Um, it's going to make it so that the organism is so deformed uh, that it's not going to be able to survive and reproduce and pass on that, that mutation to its offspring. Um, so a lot of times mutations have these bad reputation. When you think of the word uh, mutation, you probably picture like this frog with all the six different legs growing out of the wrong parts of the body. Um, and yes, mutations do tend to be disruptive. Uh, what that means is um, the normal physique of the frog um, is spelled out in the gene code, and when we have that mutation, uh, the frog cannot develop normally, and um, it's usually then not going to be able to survive, not going to be able to reproduce, and not going to be able to pass uh, this gene along to its offspring. Uh, one of the thankful things about mutations is that they are very, very rare, because your body has a lot of um, checking mechanisms to make sure that DNA is being coded in the right way, um, and it's often very, very hard for these mutations to be passed along to offspring. Because if you look at this frog, if it's got six, six legs, um, it's probably not going to be able to reproduce with other frogs um, because it would be very difficult for it to do so. So in nature, mutations are hard to pass along because usually they're so disruptive. Um, we have lots of different types of mutations that happen. Um, I actually think I will, I'll pick up with this next time, um, so you are free to go for today. Anybody else that needs to talk to me about their um, homework assignment or exam um, or anything like that, otherwise I will um, see you within Springboard on Thursday. <laughs>